chapter 11, if you would. Acts chapter 11. This is what the Lord laid on my heart. Hope it's a blessing to you. Hebrews chapter 11. And verse number 5. And the word of God says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord, that you give us this time together to gather in the house of God tonight. Father, I pray, Lord, you bless and serve, Lord. You know each heart, Lord, and you know each need, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I begin to ponder, get on the word in the Word of God. I like to uh, meditate and get my mind to turning. And I thought about this last part of this this verse of Scripture, where he said that he had this testimony that he pleased God. You couldn't ask for a best, better testimony than that right there, that you pleased God. Well, that made me do a lot of soul searching, a lot of soul searching. I think a lot of times we, we go back too far in our life sometimes. We, we think about all, all the times that we failed God. We put more emphasis on we, times that we failed God, and the devil uses that against us to get us, in, to get us down on ourselves. But we need to look on the positive things of God. We need to think about the things that he's done in our life, the positive things that that he's done in our lives. We can learn from those things where we feel like failures, but we need to focus on the things that God is pleased with in our lives. And there's many, there's many people in the Word of God that I could, I, could, I could pull out of the Scriptures and talk about how the, the, the things that they did for God and they did for the glory of God. And I notice that when you read the Scriptures and you read about the men of God and the women of God in the Bible, you think about the life that they lived and the influence that they were on people. And you, you, could, you could pull it out from any, from any book of the Bible and you can find people that please God. And the Bible says here that Enoch pleased God. And that we, shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to ourselves, we shouldn't ourselves look at man and look at man's accomplishments and think that man is, is any higher than we are because their focus... Our focus should be just like those men of old. Our focus should be on the Lord Jesus Christ and pleasing him. But we have some examples all through the word of God. But tonight, I'm going to focus on a few that's not in the Bible. Some people, by their testimony, by how they lived and how they died, we're going to see what an influence and an impact they have on where we're at right now. And I'm going to start out with one. His name is Polycarp. And you've heard our pastor talk about him before. And here's what's said about him. And he lived from 69 A.D. to 155 A.D. It says here, it says, In the Asian minor city of Smyrna, it said, Persecutions broke out against Christians, and some were put to death for their faith. The, the, the agitated mob wanted to cut off the church there by getting rid of their leader. The now-aged Polycarp, the believers... Now the aged Polycarp. The believers hid Polycarp in a farmhouse. The leaders there thought that one should not seek out martyrdom, but neither should it be avoided. If there was a, cho a choice and it, and it meant dying for Christ, said the authorities, authorities found the farmhouse and came to arrest the old man. He welcomed his captures as if they were old friends and gave them food and drink. Now imagine that. Just to think about that for just a little while. And you think about the, 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 the situation that Polycarp's in here. And we'll read it just a little bit more about him. But you think about his situation in his life. And what he was about to face. After he gave him food, food and drink. Says he asked for an hour to pray before taking to the arena. He wanted one hour to pray. I wonder if we knew our fate 
would it drive us to our knees? But this, you look at, I, look, I looked at this and I think of Polycarp. We might have a different idea of what he went to pray about. We don't know what he was praying about, but I want you to just li listen for just a little while. Since he asked for an hour to pray before being taken to the arena, said they relented. The hour stretched into two hours. The officers, overhearing his prayers, began to wonder what they were doing, arresting an old man like this. Polycarp must, they must have heard something that Polycarp that touched their hearts and done something to their hearts. He says, Polycarp was brought into the arena. Instead of Polycarp begging for his life, we find the pro council pleading with this aged bishop to just curse Christ so he would be released. Here's Polycarp's reply. Now remember, he just spent a couple of hours praying. And he says here, Polycarp replies was loud and clear. He says, 86 years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? How could he do that? I wonder how many people, if faced with a situation like this, would handle it like Polycarp. And here's what he said. He was burned alive. Note this. The Christian's presence said there was a joyful radiance on Polycarp's face as he died. A joyous radiance. You know, anytime you see anybody... Uh, how that they, they portray people on TV and, and they die and they just they're, they're gone like that and there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to it it's just like death is not anything and that's what is portrayed now that you just die and that's it that's what most people think believe it or not they think you just die and that's it but here the Bible said that there was a joyful radiance on his face who does that remind you of? Stephen Exactly. Stephen. And listen to this. Believers were allowed to bury his remains on February the 22nd, probably in the year 155. Churches near and far from Smyrna observed this date in years to come and drew strength from the testimony of this old, old man who would de not deny Christ no matter what it cost him. You know what? Polycarp had a choice. Earlier he could have cursed Christ and then let him go. But just a few hours later, when they killed him, when they burned him to the stakes, what was he gaining? For, me to, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I wonder if Polycarp read that scripture somewhere. Think about Polycarp here. No matter what it cost, if we as God's children would have that attitude that we're going to be faithful to live for God no matter what, we could live a victorious Christian life. And I believe it all comes down to this. I believe it comes down to our, our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can draw our strength from him. I believe that's what's most important. Is Polycarp's personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That he would not deny him no matter what. I don't believe there's very many people that would do that. Amen. I believe that Polycarp's testimony pleased God. I really do. Another one, we talk about a guy, his name is Hugh Latimer, from 1487 to 1555. So this was some 13, 1,300 years later. 1,300 years later. The Bible, and not the Bible, my notes here, I've got wrote down, it says, Hugh Latimer was one of the faithful preachers 
who willingly gave his life under the reign of Bloody Murray rather than renounce his belief in, in the gospel. His famous words to his friend Ridley as they were dying in the flames, he says, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out. Dying in the flames, he said, basically says, Be a man. He says, What's happening? Basically, he's saying what's happening is never going to be forgotten. We're doing this. We're dying for the glory of God. And listen, we, if, we have, if it takes die, what is the worst thing that can happen if we die and we are born again in the family of God? What is the worst thing that happens? We might suffer on this earth, but just in a short time, hallelujah to God, we'll lift our eyes in heaven and all of this stuff will, will seem as nothing. Nothing. We have to have a personal relationship, just like I've spoken about it before, how important our personal relationship with God is. But he said their bodies as a flame would be a light that should never be put out, a candle for the Lord. See, the Lord's got a job for each and every individual, each of us that are born again, we are, we are individual tools for the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses each one in a, a unique and individual way to each person that has that personal relationship with him. And we need to, we need to, to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking his face and what he wants us to do in life. Are we pleasing God? If, if, if we examine ourselves and look at our lives, and we can't do anything about what happened yesterday or last year or 10 years ago. we got to focus on right now, this day and time, is our lives glorifying God. These men's life glorified God. I believe that with all my heart and soul. There's a lot of questions in here that the Holy Spirit's going to ask you. Are you pleasing God? Are you doing what's right? Another one is Fanny J. Crosby. I think most everybody knows who Fanny J. Crosby is. And I had done a little study on her, but I hadn't studied anything like this. And the, the, here in my notes, where they, they called her the America's Hymn Queen. It says, Fred, Fanny Crosby is best remembered for the nearly 9,000 hymns she wrote. It said, but amazingly enough, she did not begin her hymn writing until she was in her 40s. She was in her 40s before she did Everybody knows that she was blind. The things she went through and the songs that she wrote. Said that before, she was in her 40s before she began publishing hymns, writings. Said a, a writer by the name of William B. Bradshaw, Bradbury was unhappy with all, all the quality of many of the hymns that were submitted to him for publication. He heard of Fanny's talent and after verifying her ability promptly hired her to write hymns for his company, telling her, while I have a publishing house, you will always have, always have work. God was fixing to use Fanny Crosby to glorify God. And her songs are sung everywhere. Her songs are sung everywhere. And do you know what she got paid for her songs back then? Sometimes a dollar or two dollars a song. Now today it's a little bit different, ain't it? I mean, you get these professional gospel singers that they got to have a certain amount of money before they even come and sing at your church. If I have to pay to hear somebody glorify God, I ain't got no use for them. I'm just to be honest with you. I'll just be honest with you. Give me Fanny Cross. Give me somebody that'll stand up for the glory of God that can't carry a tune and sing one of Fanny Crosby's songs, and I can shout hallelujah to God. Amen. Because it ain't about the, how you sound. It's about who you're singing about. It's about who you're preaching about. That's what it's all about. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we can ever figure out uh, uh, what our lives are, our lives are to glorify God. That's what our lives are for. It ain't about 
I know people that all that they do is they, they, they live their life for, for gain, for what they can accomplish, for what, what they can do and what the things they can have, their, their boats and their cars and, and everything like that, which will get them nowhere with God. You having a brand new car ain't going to please God. Us getting on our face before God and calling out to a personal Savior, that is what's important in our Christian life. I made, I made a point. You can ask my wife, and I, she'll tell you the truth. Three weeks ago, I gathered 30, I gathered 30 years of preaching notes and study notes, and I throw them in the trash. And I said, God, I said, from here on out, God, I said, if, if, it, if I get it, it's going to come from you. It's not going to come from a book. It's going to come from you. And I've determined that I'm going to go get a hold of God, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to seek his face, and I'm going to try to obey him to my best ability to do what he's called me to do. I just want to be a tool in his tool belt. And let him use me for his glory and for his honor. Because that's what's important. Fanny knew she needed God's help in this new endeavor. And once described her hymn writing this way. She said, it may seem a little old-fashioned. Always to begin one's work with prayer. She said, but I never undertake a hymn without first asking the good Lord to be my inspiration. What, what, the songs that you, you hear today, I mean, there's songs that were sung 30 years ago that were bad too. And one of the worst songs I believe I've ever heard is I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain, doing my best to get it in. Does that stuff come from God? No. You think, that's, you think God inspired them to write that song? No. No. I don't believe that for one bit. But she sought for God's inspiration from all areas of Fanny's life while passing by, listen to this, while passing by a prisoner, she heard the man cry, Oh, Lord, don't pass me by. Sounds familiar, don't it? Which quickly became the hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. You see, if we have that, I'll keep harping on it. If we have that real, close, personal relationship with the Lord, we'll, we can grasp and we can go, uh, grab a hold of those things like Fanny Crosby did. Do you think that was just a coincidence that she walked by and heard that man say that? God was all in that. God's all in that. When her friend, Howard Doan, played a medley for her and said, See if it says anything to you. Her joyful reply was, What that says is safe in the arms of Jesus. She said, Within a half, listen to this, within a half an hour, she had finished the poem, her most famous hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Amen. Blessed Assurance. In 30 minutes' time, God took that and she had it written in 30 minutes' time. And what did she, what, what did Fanny make of all of her songs? What was every song of hers about? It was about one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Her life. Did you know, her, you know in her life, she, she once said, she said, if I had the opportunity right now to that I could get my sight back, she said, I would say no. Because she learned more about the Lord at being blind than most of us with, with, eyesight, with good eyesight. Because what? Because she's seen with her heart. She's seen with her heart. We put too much emphasis on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, what we see instead of on faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we see the faith of Fanny Crosby. You remember one of the other songs she sung? Brother Don Rayle used to sing it. All the way my Savior leads me. And what did she say in the song? That he was her guide. <laughs> he was her, her guide. 
If we let the Lord God, we let the Lord Jesus guide us like he guided Fanny Crosby by faith, the Lord will always lead you by faith. We, we could live a victorious life. And I believe that Fanny Crosby is another one that pleased God. Is our lives pleasing God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you give me tonight. Pray, Lord, you take it. Lord, use it for your glory, for your honor, Lord. And we love you and thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.